Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. In a previous lecture, I talked about the discovery of plate tectonics by Alfred Wegener, his realization that the continents used to fit together and that they move across the surface of the Earth. Later work confirmed this and discovered at seafloor spreading centers, new oceanic crust is produced. The ocean floor is young because it's then later subducted underneath the continents. I talked about this, but I didn't talk much about continents themselves. What you're looking at there is a little, almost forgotten, perhaps, corner of the world near the South Pole. Up in the, in the upper left-hand side of this Google Earth image, you'll see the southern tip of South America, Tierra del Fuego, the Andes Mountains, Snowcap, and then to the lower right, you'll see Antarctica, between them the Drake Passage. But up there to the upper right, you'll see a little arc, a little shadowed arc, and that's actually a small trench. It's called the South Sandwich Trench. It's where the South American oceanic plate subducts underneath a very small oceanic plate called the South Sandwich Plate. The South Sandwich Plate is fairly young. It's younger than the South American oceanic plate in that area. And so it happens that you have two ocean crusts that are meeting. What happens then? It turns out that one is subducted under the other. You don't have to have a continent for that to work. In this case, you've got a piece of young ocean crust. Young means warm, and warm means it's expanded in volume. It's less dense. At a place like the South Sandwich Trench, what's happening is the ocean crust of the South, of the South American plate uh, to the right in this image. It's subducting underneath, and so inevitably what's going to happen is that material is melting. It's rising back up. So, But what's melting this time is actually ocean crust, and what's melting is basaltic oceanic crust. And then the partial melt of that is rising up through another slab of basaltic oceanic crust. And that partial melt forms volcanoes from the seabed and start growing. Eventually they will grow up to breach the waves and form volcanic island chain. And in fact, this is a very common thing on our planet. There are a lot of systems like this that produce what we call these island arcs. These are island arcs that are volcanic islands formed from the, from the subduction of a plate beneath another plate. No continent involved in this case. And yet you do form islands, and the rock of that island material is going to be a lot less like basalt and it's going to be a lot more like, if not granite, an intermediate rock type, not as dense and heavy as basalt, a little less magnesium and iron in it, and so the minerals are less dense and heavy. And it's not quite granite yet, probably, but it's part way there. This refining process, taking a partial melt of a previous rock and having that melt be different in composition, is how you form continents in the first place. Our planet began essentially covered over in basaltic crust, and later continents began to accrue from the interactions of those oceanic crustal plates. And so slowly continents built up. You can look at these individual islands. For example, this island, Montagu Island, is one of the South Sandwich Islands in this, in this incipient island arc chain. And if you zoom into it, you look here, for example, at this island. It's dominated by one major volcano, Mount Belinda. And this satellite photograph is actually erupting in progress. You can see the volcanic gas and ash plume rising from the summit. And it turns out that this is a very active volcano. Other satellite photography, such as this here, showing an active lava flow on that small island in the South Atlantic. The active, the red you see there is a real color image of lava flowing down the side of that mountain into the water. And so it's building new land. This is an actively growing set of islands that may one day merge if they become large enough and become very something very similar to the island nation of Japan. The Japanese archipelago is entirely generated from the subduction of the Pacific plate underneath, and then islands, volcanic islands, begin to rise, and over the millions of years, as they're continuously fed by more and more and more magma from below, from the continuous ongoing subduction, then that magma translates into new land, and the islands can grow until they merge and become a significant continental landmass. A piece of a new continent is born. If you look here along a very long view across the western United States, including Mexico and Canada, you see in this image the spine of the western mountains running from north to south across the North American continent. You see these vertical mountain ranges, and these are also the result of subduction-related volcanism. In this case, not an island arc, but a mountain arc of volcanoes, a volcanic arc on the side of a continent. And as subduction has gone on, 
in this area in the past. It has risen up mountain chain after mountain chain, some island arcs that are then pushed by the subduction process that, that pushes against the continent. They're pushed up against to form a new mountain range right on the side of the continent. And so you get the Western United States and Canada being a series of mountain chains with a long, complicated history, subduction-related creation of continental crust. What I'd like to do in this presentation is demonstrate what a partial melt is about and how it relates to magma and lava. I keep using the term partial melt, and I want to explain what I mean by that. So a rock is usually, like this illustration I put together on the right, a rock is usually made up of many different kinds of minerals jumbled together to make up the entire rock composition. When I talk about melting rock, it might be natural for you to think in terms of melting something like ice, because you've seen that. You take a piece of ice, it melts to water completely. You pour that water into a cup, you freeze it, it turns back to ice completely. Butter melts and then can be hardened again by cooling it. So that's not how most rocks are, because rocks are not made of one thing, usually. Things like a sandstone can be very pure quartz, but most rocks, especially igneous rocks, especially mantle rock, peridotite in the mantle, is made up of several different minerals that are all put together, jumbled together into one tightly compacted mass. Now, if you have a heat flow from, from beneath, from the lower mantle, say, or just a, a heat anomaly in the mantle, or the mantle rock is convected to be shallow enough near the crust that the, the loss of pressure allows it to melt, then you're only going to produce a partial melt. You're only going to produce a, a small partial melt of the whole rock. And the minerals with the lowest melting points are going to be the ones that liquefy first. Every different kind of mineral in there has a different melting point, And some are lower and higher than others. When you raise the temperature of a massive mantle rock, you're going to see, at first, a little bit of, bit of melt appear along grain boundaries where there's a lot of elements that don't go easily into other minerals and get crowded out and then just sort of solidify as a thin glass that sort of forms a matrix that surrounds all the grains of other minerals. That stuff is going to start to melt first along grain boundaries. You can see within the cracks of this diagram of this rock, parts of it are turning red. And then as you heat up, the lowest melting point minerals. You're going to be heating up and then melting things that have the lowest melting points, and you're going to stay in solid form the things that have the highest melting points. After a partial melt forms, as this mineral has just dissolved into this into this melt, this, this magma comprised of only the composition of that mineral, leaving behind minerals with higher melting point. You're leaving behind things that minerals, silicate minerals that contain magnesium, iron, calcium. Magnesium, iron, calcium, silicate minerals are denser and heavier and typically have pretty high melting points. So you, you leave those behind as you begin to heat up and melt more minerals from the structure. So what goes into the first melt then? What elements am I talking about? Primarily things like potassium sodium. These are light metals that easily will go into melt because they, they form in minerals that have fairly low melting points. Silicate minerals, potassium silicates, sodium silicates like feldspar, and these have fairly low melting points, along with phosphorus. Phosphorus forms phosphate in rock. Calcium phosphate, the mineral apatite, is quite common, especially in igneous rocks and in mantle rock. And so that will form a melt at fairly low temperature, and its elemental contribution will add to that melt, along with things like rare earth elements, represented here by samarium. The rare earth elements as a whole don't tend to readily go into a lot of minerals, and the ones they go into tend to have fairly low melting points. And they tend to be the first things that melt out of a mineral because they're often not completely compatible with the mineral lattice. And so rare earths will tend to go into the first melt, and their concentrations are highest in the earliest partial melt. The net result of this is you've produced a partial sample of what the original rock was. The first melt that you produce is going to have its contribution being primarily, almost entirely at that point, from the minerals that have the lowest melting points, potassium, silicates, sodium silicates, phosphate rock, and odd elements like the rare earth elements going into that, which means that the melt has a very different composition than the original rock. It's lighter, it's less dense, it's m less like heavy basalt, and it'll be more like a diorite or an endosite. So when you partially melt a rock, the melt is going to be lighter, less dense. It's going to be enriched in certain elements like potassium, sodium, phosphorus, the rare earths. It's going to be depleted in elements like magnesium and iron and calcium. And so if you melt peridotite from the mantle, the mix that you get, the blend of minerals liquefying to contribute to that early melt, that composition is basaltic. It contains a fair bit of magnesium and iron because peridotite contains more. And so its partial melt is basaltic. Now, if you take basaltic rock, as I discussed earlier 
into talking about the South Sandwich Island and do a partial melt of that. It's the, say you do a 5-10% melt from a basalt. You're going to get something even less dense and less enriched in the, in the heavy, what we call mafic elements. Uh, magnesium and iron. If you melt a basalt partially, you get something like a diorite, which is a lighter rock. You could even get a, a granite. If you then partially melt the diorite, or partially melt it again, uh, by waves of magma coming up and mixing with the stuff already there, as the volcanoes build, as the island or mountain landmass builds from this process of subduction-related mountain building. That's how you build granite. That's how you make granite. You start to erupt volcanoes that are primarily composed of granitic material. You're producing andesite at the surface, uh, tough andesite, ash, and volcanic rock. You're producing granite from magma chambers that rise but don't erupt onto the surface. Granite is composed primarily of things like quartz, feldspar, mica, things that have a lot of sodium, potassium, aluminum, and silicates, uh, but a lot less iron and a whole lot less magnesium. And so it's from this kind of material, it's from this rock that continents are formed. Something like the Grand Teton are mountains that have risen up from material that is continental granite rock. This is how continents are born. And in the early stages of Earth's history, ocean crust alone would have covered the planet. And then as time went on, subduction of ocean crust under other ocean crust produced landmass that built up. You get things like Japan, you get larger land masses, and they grow into larger and larger continental blocks. And so over time, the continents have built up. We think the earliest true continents were about 2.5 billion years ago. Continents can also run into each other, build up, and when they do, they're colliding. And when continents collide, you build up magnificent mountain ranges, which I'll talk about in an upcoming lecture.